science or hermeneutics, which is a science, an art of a science, to determine what are the tools that are needed to uh, bring interpretation. Now, there are three kinds of interpreters. Number one, there's a legal interpreter, then there's a false interpreter, and then there's a true interpreter. There's some people that um, are, are legal interpreters, and we're going to get into that a little bit uh, tonight. So let's look at, um, for the first, as we get into these three aspects of qualifications, let's look at the legal in, uh, interpreters tonight, and let's look at Acts 13.27, if you can. Turn in your Bibles. If you don't have your Bible, it'll be up on the screen for you, and... Uh, if you look at it, you'll see Acts 13, 27 reads this way. For they that dwell at Jerusalem and their rulers, because they knew him not, nor yet the, the voices of the prophets, which are read every Sabbath day, they have fulfilled them in condemning him. Now, let me, write, let me read that again for you, okay? For they that dwell at Jerusalem and their rulers, because they knew him not, nor yet the voices of the prophets, which are read every Sabbath day, they have fulfill, fulfilled them in condemning him, meaning Jesus. Okay? So you have, the, you have the Pharisees and the scribes. The scribes were the interpreters. Okay? And the Pharisees were the religious bunch. And uh, they were very legalistic. And so they were the legal interpreters of, of Scripture. And uh, if you look at uh, uh, one of the examples of their legalism, if you look in John chapter 8, we're going to be reading from verse 1 to 11 tonight. You'll see that there is a legalistic aspect to Phariseeism. Phariseeism. Now, we don't want to be Pharisees, amen? None of us want to be a Pharisee, okay? Because Pharisees can't see very far. <laughs> okay, Pharisees are very religious and pomp, and they're always looking for the outward circumstance. But Jesus made a very interesting uh, observation about the Pharisees. He said, do what they say, but don't do as they do, for they say and don't do. Amen. So there are some things that the Pharisees did that were good. Okay? They honored God. They honored the Sabbath. They honored you know, their mother and father. They obeyed the Ten Commandments the best they could. But what they say, Jesus said, do what they say, but don't do as they do, because they say, but don't do. There's some certain things that they were saying to the people you know, about uh, piety and all this stuff, but they weren't really doing it either. And we're going to see that for a moment, okay? So in, in verse, uh, chapter 8, verse 1, it says this. Jesus went up, and you can just roll right through the scriptures as I read them. Jesus went up, uh, went up, uh, went unto the Mount of Olives, and early in the morning he came again into the temple. And all the people came unto him, and he sat down, and he taught them. And the scribes, remember who the scribes were, they were what? What were the scribes? I just told you. I gave you the answer about two, two minutes ago. Huh? Huh? No. The scribes were the interpreters. Okay? The scribes were the interpreters. They interpreted the word of God. Okay? So get that because it's very, it's very vital that you understand that. The scribes were the ones that interpreted scripture and the Pharisees were the religious leaders, okay? And it says the scribes and the Pharisees. So you had the legalists, you had the scribes that were the interpreters of the word of God, okay? They were the ones interpreting the Bible, okay, if you will, the Old Testament, okay? And so they had the scholars, if you will, okay, of the interpreters, and they had the religious uh, pharisaical uh, priests and, and so forth. And they brought, him unto, they brought unto him a woman taken in adultery. And when they had set her in the midst, in other words, they took and they threw her right in the midst of Jesus, they said unto him, Master, this woman was taken in adultery in the very act. So they were waiting, okay, for this woman to meet with this man. And as they were, how can I say it politely, engaging, okay, they rushed in, grabbed her off or whatever, grabbed her from the man, Okay, dragged her and put her in front of Jesus. And he said, now, listen to this. Now, it, they were telling Jesus this. Now, remember who Jesus is, right? Okay, so they're going to tell Jesus, okay, who is the living word, what the written word says. Okay. Now, Moses in the law commanded us, okay, that such should be stoned. But what sayest thou? 
What do you say, Jesus? Stop, just stop for a minute before you go to the next scripture. Here they, they're going by the Bible, and if, it, if I could interpret it in today's language, this is what a lot of people do. The Bible says, see, the Bible says right here, it says it right here, that if a woman's caught in adultery, she should be stoned. Now, what do you say? That's what was happening. They were using the Bible, they were using the Word of God in a legalistic format. Does the Word of God say that about adulterers? Yes, it does. But let's see what Jesus said. Next verse. This they said, tempting him, that they might have an, uh, a, reason to, uh, or an, uh, to, a reason to accuse him of something. Now, did Jesus get shook up? Did he get argumentative? Did he start telling them how wrong they were? No. He just stooped down, and with his finger, he wrote on the ground as though he didn't even hear them. Next verse, please. And so when they continued asking him, they didn't give up. They were persistent. So when they were continually asking him, what are you going to do about this? This is what the Bible says. This is what God's word says. This is what Moses, the prophet of God, the man of God, who went up to the mountain, got the commandments from God. We know God spoke through Moses. He lifted himself up and he said unto them something very interesting. He that is without sin among you, let him cast a stone at you. See, they were so legalistic, they had forgotten the mercy and the grace that God had given them. Because every, one of, every single one of us in this room stood guilty before God. We deserve death. For the wages of sin is death. We all deserve to die. We all deserve to have death. Death, separation from God for eternity. We all deserve that because we were sinners. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. But the gift of God, hallelujah, is salvation through Jesus Christ, the Bible says. Come on, somebody. Hallelujah. If you understand grace, grace is not a license to sin, but grace is a way to get forgiveness and restoration back to God. Hallelujah. And it says he, he again stooped down and he wrote on the ground. Now some commentators now, they say, well, probably what Jesus was writing was women's name that they had done it with. Done it with. But we don't know that. That's just conjecture. Okay, some commentaries say that. That's why they were guilty. I don't believe that. But that's what they said. And they which heard it, see it says they that which heard it, let he who has no sin cast the first stone. Now understand, when Jesus spoke the word, he was the living word. When he spoke God's word, there was, there was life and conviction to it. And so when, he, when they heard it, being convicted by their own conscience, and that's what Jesus was trying to, to show them. Went out one by one, beginning at the eldest, even to the last, and Jesus was left alone. And the woman was standing in the midst. If you read your Bible, you see that God desires mercy. He says, I'll be merciful to those who are merciful. And a lot of times we want to point the finger at people that are doing things wrong, just like the Pharisees. Now, I'm not saying we shouldn't make people accountable. We should. People should be accountable, and we should judge certain things in the church. But God has not called us to be a Pharisee. God has not called us to be one of the scribes, the legalists of, of interpreting God's word and just pointing everything bad. Every, every, oh, you've got to die. A witch should die. If, you're, if you know a witch, she should be stoned too, because that's what the Bible says. No. God will give grace and mercy. So here, Jesus lifted up himself and he saw no none but the woman. And he said to the woman, where are those thine accusers? Hath no man condemned thee? And she said, no man, Lord. 
And Jesus said this to her. Listen to this. Neither do I condemn thee. Can you imagine for a moment, just imagine for a moment, you in that person's situation. Just imagine you, you, are, you, you don't know God. You're in that situation. You're in a relationship with this man. You're committing adultery with this man. They come and grab you, put you before Jesus, a holy, righteous man. Can you imagine the feelings of guilt, of condemnation that woman must have felt? And when Jesus said to her, where are those thine accusers? Is there any that condemns you? And she says, no, Lord. And then he says these words to her, neither do I condemn you. But he didn't stop. A lot of people stop there. But he says, go and sin no more. In other words, he wasn't telling her, now see, you can interpret that and say, see, we, we, can, we can become sinless because he said, go and sin no more to the girl so that girl can go and sin no more. No, 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 no. He's saying, go and sin no more in the very thing that you're now standing here for. Don't go do that anymore. So, what is that? That's, that's the way you interpret the Bible. You don't terp, interpret it as a legal aspect of putting condemnation on people. They're condemned already. Jesus said, I didn't come into the world to condemn the world. I came into the world to save them. Can I get an amen? At least somebody. Come on. He said, I didn't come in the world to condemn the world. The world's already condemned. Unsaved people are already condemned. He said, but I came that they may have life, and they may have life more abundantly. How are they going to get that life? By how you live your life, and how you become a light. For you are the light of the world, the Bible says. That you came in, you come into the light, God has translated you out of the kingdom of darkness into his marvelous light, so that you can be a light unto the Gentiles, so that you can be, you can, your life can shine. It's not so much what we say, it's who we are as a Christian. How you live your life as a Christian. People are going to look at you and say, you know, sister, when I look at you, I see Jesus. in you. I see compassion. I see love. I see, I see kindness. But I also see truth. That you're not afraid to tell me the truth about my life. You're not ashamed to tell me, that, you know, if I'm doing something wrong because you love me. That's what real love's all about. That's why the Bible says, whom God loves, he corrects. So all of these things in interpreting the Bible is very, very important. So you have the legal interpreters. And then you have the false interpreters. And we have plenty of those. Let me tell you that. Okay? If you look at the false interpreters, the scripture also refers to another group of interpreters who are clearly revealed as false. In 2 Corinthians 4.2, Paul refers to those who are guilty of Handling the word of God deceitfully. That's the amplified version. Uh, 2 Corinthians 4.2. Can you put that up there for me, please? Okay. But I have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness, not, hand, not handling the word of God deceitfully. But by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. Not handling the word of God deceitfully. There are those who handle the word of God deceitfully. Jesus warned the disciples many, many, many times. He said in the last days, one of the greatest things that's going to be unleashed in the world is deception. That's why he said, let no man deceive you. Don't let any man deceive you. How are they going to deceive you? Well, by interpreting the Bible incorrectly. By telling you what the Bible says versus what it really means. I'll give you some examples. Ephesians 4.14, Paul speaks of those who, in relation to doctrine, use the sleet of men in cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive. Ephesians 4.14. That we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the sleet of men by, and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive. So men have the, the, uh, the capability, if you will, or the lack of, of ability to properly interpret the Bible. 
That's why it's so important for you and I to learn how to interpret the Bible so that we know. Well, you say, well, well, Pastor, we got the Holy Spirit. Yeah, we got the Holy Spirit. But don't forget, the Holy Spirit used words, sentences, nouns, pronouns, verbs, adjectives. He used all the sentence, sentence qualifications. He used all of those things to, put, to, to make paragraphs and sentences so that you and I could read the Word and understand the Word. So it's not, just the, it's not just the spiritual thing. Yes, we have the Holy Spirit, but we also have the Word interpreting it properly. And one of the tests of that, because, see, if people, if people just say, I, I trust the, the voice of the Holy Spirit subjectively, then my question to them is this. Then if it's subjective truth, how do we judge it? Like the Bible says, test the Spirit to see if it's of God. How do we test it to find out how it's true? How do we test it? Yeah, but if you're going to test it by the Word of God, you've got to be able to rightly divide the Word. So I'll give you some examples. Look at 2 Peter 3.16. 2 Peter 3.16. As also in all his epistles, speaking in them of th these things, in which are some things hard to be understood, meaning about Paul's writing, which they that are unlearned, underline that in your Bible, unlearned. There's nothing wrong with learning. You cannot get a halfway decent job without having at least a high school education. If you want to go on and have a, a greater ed education in college and stuff, you can get a higher education job you get a higher paying job. But when it comes to the Word of God, why are we so lazy? When it comes to the Word of God, why do we put, why do we put not learning at the top? We put it at the bottom. Not that we're going to look at scholastic uh, you know, achievements. No. But there should be a hunger in you, there should be a desire in you, excuse me, to know what the Bible says and rightly dividing that. Look what he says which they that are unlearned and unstable, they rest as they do also other scriptures, or they twist, the word unstable or rest, they actually twist the scriptures as they do also other scriptures unto their own destruction. I'm going to give you an example. How many of you in, have listened to Christian ministries and pastors on TV? I'm not going to name anyone. But I'm sure that you've even heard this in some churches that you may have attended. Right? And they stop praying. Or they stop speaking. They say, the Bible says that we're going to call those things that are not as though they were. Right? How many have heard that? Mostly everybody's heard that. Okay? Call those things that are not as though they were. What scripture do they use for that? Romans chapter 4 verse 17. We're going to speak those things into existence. We're going to call those things that are not as though they were. Well, let's look at Romans 4.17. I think he fell asleep. First of all, let's, let's qualify it. First phrase that says, it says what? As it is written. What does that mean? What was Paul saying there? He was quoting something. As it is written. Okay. As it is written. So it had to be written somewhere. That's in the Old Testament. Okay. Now let's qualify that. I have made thee a father of many nations. Let's qualify that. Who said that? Who did he say it to? He said it to Abraham, right? When he said, I'm going to make thee a father of many nations, before whom he believed. And the word even there, if you see it's in italicized there. I'm, in my Bible it's italicized, but it's in brackets there. Even. That's not in the original uh, Greek. They put that in for clarification. Okay? But if you read it, it says, before him, he, whom he believed, God, who quickened the dead, and calls those things be, which be not as though they were. That's not you and I. 
calling those things. That's the context of that scripture. It's God who quickens the dead. It's God who calls those things that are not as though they were. He told Abraham, you're going you're to have sons and you're going to have sons like the sands of the sea. You're going you're gonna to have the, the land of, I'm going to give you the land of, of the Philistines and the Canaanites and Hittites. And he told them all those things before it even happened. So God is the one that calls those things that are not as though they were. You and I do not have that ability to do that. If this is the scripture they're using to verify it, they're not interpreting scripture properly. You follow me? Another one is Galatians 3.28. You know this one pretty well. I had a conversation with someone one time. They said, see the scripture? There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female. For you're all one in Christ Jesus. Okay. Well, they were using this as, as a proof text so that a woman could be a pastor. Okay. Some of you are shaking your heads no. <laughs> But I'm just telling you, I'm just telling you, this is the text that they use for a proof text that there's neither male nor female, so God doesn't go by gender, so a woman can be a pastor. So here's my question. If this scripture is interpreted that way, right? If it is interpreted that way, then homosexual marriage should be okay too. Lesbian marriage should be okay too. Because there's neither male nor female. So if I want to fall in love with a man, I should be able to because there's no male or female. There's no gender. Follow how stupid that is? That's stupid. This, if you read the context, the scriptures before, the scriptures after, it has absolutely nothing to do with the Ephesians 4 Doma gifts. It has to do with salvation. If you read the context... But see, people will jump off the wagon and say, oh, no, see. No. It's not true. You can't use a text to prove your, your teaching that it's God when it's out of context. In fact, when you go to school, when you go to Bible school, they teach you a text out of context is a pretext. Can't survive truth. It can't, su can't survive the actual interpreting of the scriptures properly or exegetical pre uh, uh, interpretation. We're going to get into that. So you, you got, I just gave you two examples of two scriptures that even pastors, even pastors take out of context and speak these things and everybody's clapping and li lifting their hands and and they don't understand they're getting false doctrine. They're getting false teaching. Now, I'm not telling you that's what I, I think. I'm giving you the scriptures, and I'm giving it to you in context of who the author is, who is speaking, who they are speaking to. These are all tools that you need when you, when you interpret a, a scripture. You've got to say, okay, what was the original intent of the letter? Who was the letter that was written in the scriptures intended to, to be for? What, what did he mean? What was the cultural background? What's the historical background? What's the textual background? What's the context of what he was speaking about? Who was he speaking to? What was the issue? What was going on there? You, those are questions that you have to ask as an interpreter when you're interpreting the Word of God. And some of these preachers that are out there, and they're, they're teaching things that are so contrary to the Bible. No wonder we, the church is in a mess. No wonder there's 50,000 different doctrines all over the place. Everybody's interpreting the scriptures the, the, way, the way they want to. But the Bible tells us that the, the scriptures are not for personal interpretation. Come on, somebody, hallelujah. So we have legal interpreters, then we have false interpreters. You, all you've got to do is turn the TV on. You can, if you've if you got a, any kind of discernment, you can discern and you can, you can, you know, something just doesn't sound right. Something's just not right. That don't sit with me. Then you get the word of God and you begin to, you begin to read and God leads you to scriptures and you begin to, you begin to look up the words and, and understand what the words mean. 
it, there's a scripture in, uh, before we go on, in Peter, talks about unbelieving husbands. If you have an unbelieving husband, it says to the wives that you will win your husband by your chaste conversation. And some, some, some uh, ladies that are married think, well, I just got to talk my husband to death. I'll just keep talking to him. I'm going to tell him about Jesus up and down and all the time because that scripture says, you know, by my chaste conversation, I'm going to. But that's not what it means. If you go back and you look up that word conversation in the Greek, it means by your lifestyle, how you live. Not by what you say. It's an old, it's an old English word, okay, that if you look it up in the dictionary, okay, if you look it up in the Greek, very easy to do, Bind's Dictionary, just look up the word communication, it means lifestyle. It doesn't mean by what you say. Because you know, how many know talk is cheap? Talk is cheap. And some husbands, as soon as you start talking, they turn it off. Okay, You, the, you, you think they're listening to you, but they're standing, they're going, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. They ain't hearing a word you're saying. You can tell them about Jesus all day long. That ain't going to do any good. It's how you live. It's your example of how you live the Christian life before your husband, how you, you honor him and you love him, and you, and you know, all those things. So that's one area, one way. So a true interpreter. Luke 24, Jesus is revealed as the perfect interpreter. In verse 27, he says, look at this in uh, Luke 24. Verse 27. I love this about Jesus. And beginning, and beginning at what? Moses. And all the prophets. He expounded. That word expounded means interpret. Hallelujah. Unto them in all the scriptures, the things concerning himself. He expounded, expository. It's a bringing of the meaning of, of the words out of Scripture versus what's called, that what's called uh, exegesis. You're, you're exiting out the meaning. You're not putting eisegesis. You're not putting the meaning into the Scripture. You're not making it mean whatever you want. I told you one that, uh, that when I was a very young Christian, I met this girl, and I, I was like, wow, you know, this girl is pretty neat. This was before I was married and stuff. And uh, I went right into Proverbs. I was reading one day, and I just looked through my Bible, and I came to the Scripture that said this, take her, for she is thy life. It's in Proverbs. And I was like, God, are you, are you, are you telling me she's the one? <laughs> take her, for she is thy life. Turns out she wasn't. <laughs> What's he talking about? Wisdom! Take her for she, for she is thy light. Wisdom! He's talking about wisdom. He's not talking about a girl. But see how easy it is to misinterpret the scriptures in God and thinking, wow, God's telling me to take her. No, he's not telling you to take her. It has nothing to do with it. It's out of context. God will never tell you something that's contrary to his word. Another example of true interpreting. Now, I don't want to offend any ladies that might be watching through Facebook, and I don't want to, I don't want to offend anyone here that may be single. But if you have a pastor or if I'm your pastor, do not come to me and tell me God told you to marry an unbeliever. That's not what the Bible says. You should not marry an unbeliever. Well, you know, the Lord told me that I should marry him and I'm going to win him to Jesus. No, you're not. He may win you back into the world. What did God tell Solomon? Don't marry those women. They'll take your heart from me. 
Come on, somebody. All we got to do is know the word. Know the word. So don't come to me, ladies, and say, oh, he's the one. Because I'm going to ask you, is he a Christian? Well, no, not. Well, he's, he, he likes to go to church. No, I don't want to hear that. Okay, no. No. If we're going to do things right, let's do things right. Amen? Praise the Lord. We're not getting into that right now. That's not the study tonight. Okay. And that's an exception to the rule. So, see, again, we can, we can make anything, anything say anything we want to make it say if we take it out of context. So, that's a whole other study about, you're talking about Hosea, I believe, right? Yeah, yeah I, I know. God told him to marry a prostitute. But that was for, the, uh, for an outward example of Israel. Okay, to, to show Israel there that they were prostitutes from God. So he uses, he used, the, he used, a, an, uh, he used a, an example, a, a, a natural example. So that doesn't give you permission to go marry prostitutes. Okay. I, had a, I had a guy one time told me, he says, there's nothing wrong with smoking marijuana. God made it. Well, that's true. God made everything, right? So he said to me, this, you know, there's nothing wrong with smoking marijuana. God made it. So I said, okay. I said, God made poison ivory too, but I don't see you rolling around in it. <laughs> right? Why not? God made poison ivory. Why aren't you rolling around in it? We get silly. Second Timothy two fifteen. We'll talk a little bit about that tonight. Okay. I'm going to give you the uh, what I call the the LV version. The LV version. How many have ever heard the LV vision? That's called the lazy version. Don't put too much effort into the things of God. A lazy man that needs not to be ashamed taking the word of God any way you choose. That's the lazy version. What does the Bible say? Oh. Now, how many, people, how many people here went to university? Anybody go to university? College. Okay. Anyone go to high school? Okay. Anyone go to junior high school, right? Did you just, when you went into class, did you take all your books, just kept them in your bag and just... That's because maybe you were. <laughs> okay. No, but you had to put what? Effort. When you were a baby, they taught you A, B, C, D, E, F, G. You didn't go A, L, J, K, N, and go up through your high school thinking J was K and L was M. No. There was a systematic way of teaching you. You didn't go from kindergarten to ninth grade. Why? Why not go from kindergarten to ninth grade? The process. The Bible even is a process of learning too. The Bible says line upon line, precept upon precept. Here a little, there a little. Okay? It's a precept. Line upon line, here a little, there a little. No, 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 no. Nobody's going to have, no, I don't care. The greatest preacher with the greatest degrees is not going to be the smartest person in the world. Okay? I know a man, I'm not going to mention his name, powerful man of God, is the president of a 
Theological Seminary president, okay, been in ministry for years, has a PhD in, in, I believe, in expository preaching. Okay? And he says that you can receive the mark of the beast and still be saved. I told you I'm not going to mention the name. Just look it up online. Go to your friend Google. But think about that. All he's got to do is read the context. Their smoke shall rise and their torment shall rise from everlasting to everlasting for eternity. And he's educated. So just because someone's educated doesn't mean they know the truth. And it doesn't mean that if they once knew the truth that they will continue in the truth. The way you stay continuing in the truth is you stay humble. When you get all proud, and I, I tell people this all the time, you know, your degrees don't pile up high this way so you can stand taller. Your degrees go this way. It doesn't go this way. If I get a degree, that doesn't mean I'm up here now. They're all down there. No. I'm on the same level, but I only have more accountability and more responsibility because I know more of the truth. Come on now. Study. It's hard work. That's why when I asked how many of you have dictionaries, I think only a few of your hands went up. I was like, wow. If you really want to know the Bible, you want to really know truth, get, you need to get a Strong's Dictionary. It has all of the words of the Bible in it, every single word, Hebrew and Greek. And if you look up the word hot, it'll tell you everywhere in the Bible where that word hot is. It'll tell you the, the proper proper number for that in the Hebrew and the proper number of that in the Greek. And you look it up. I had a seven-year-old boy tell me that one time. Study. Study the history. Study the culture. Find out when Jesus said, my sheep know my voice. What did he mean by that? Is he talking about real life sheep? Bah, bah. No. He said, my sheep know my voice. But how do we equate that in our culture? We, we don't have sheep. We eat it. It's called lamb chops. But how do we understand that unless we understand the culture? And I kind of explained this a couple of weeks ago. The culture was... A shepherd would get together with other shepherds, and they'd be in the field, and there'd be like maybe 10 or 12 different flocks together. So when you're talking, to, when you're talking in, the, in, the, in the Eastern culture about a shepherd and sheep knowing their voice, one of, if the, one of the shepherds was deciding to leave, he would say, Come! And all of his sheep, among all the other sheep that would be out there, would lift their heads and they'd see him walking, they would all come and leave the other sheep and come and follow him. Isn't that cool? So when, he was, when Jesus was given that analogy of something in the natural but with a spiritual meaning, he's saying to them, my sheep know my voice. Not only do they know the voice, but when they hear the shepherd speak and he says, follow me, there's no, uh, I don't know if I want to, I don't think I can, I don't know. Should I? No, they automatically go. It's instant obedience. And that's what he's that's the lesson there. Oh, this is good stuff, man. Hallelujah. Not because of me. Study for what purpose? To show yourself approved unto man. So man cannot can give you accolades and give you trophies and give you all. No. Study to show yourself approved to God. Study is work. Today in school, they're just passing the kids through. They don't care if they learn. They don't care if, they're, if, they're edu if their minds are at that level of education to the grade that they're in. They don't care. Just pass them through, like cattle. Just 
Just pass them through. It doesn't matter if they really learned anything. Just pass them through. Okay, yeah, we got a great outcome. Yeah, we got an 89% graduation rate. Yeah, but how many of them know anything? How many of them really spend time with their students and tell them, look, your whole life is dependent on these years that you put into your life right now. What you are today is going to set you for the future. What your thinking is today, if you keep on thinking that way, is going to be your future. Your grades today is what's going to be your future. So try hard. Work hard. Get the best grades you can. Take this time in your life to study. Same with the things of God. You know, there's the high percentage of Christians today don't even know how to witness. I mean, you talk to, you talk to people, and, whoa, oh, oh my, I don't, what am I going to say? What are you going to say? How long have you been a Christian? 25 years. How many people you won to Jesus? Well, none. <laughs> What's the purpose of being a Christian? What's the purpose of the church? It's not to have conferences. It's not so I can sell you my CDs and my DVDs. That's not the purpose of the church. Jesus came to seek and to save the lost. Oh, Rabbi Shiri Abakai. God has come to save and seek the lost. That's the whole purpose of the church. Well, Pastor, that's your job. No, it's not. My job is to tend to the sheep. Especially when you get a lot of sheep that don't know my voice. <laughs> you got a lot of sheep that are bleeping. And they're fighting with each other. Biting each other's fur. <laughs> Come on now, somebody. You know I'm telling the truth, right? It's a trick of the devil. To get a church out of focus of what we're supposed to be doing. We're not supposed to have all these conferences. You don't need it. Get into a good, solid Bible teaching church. You'll grow. God wants you to grow. Workmen that needeth not to be ashamed. Not to be ashamed. But rightly dividing. Word of truth. There was one time I was doing a study on something, and I was so excited about studying this one particular subject in the Bible. And I got to one word. This is the truth. I spent nine hours on that one word. I researched that word all the way back to its Latin form, all the way back to its Greek form, all the way back to its Hebrew form. I was searching that thing and looking. I wanted to know what that word meant. Meant. What was the culture? What was behind that word when it was? What was, the, what was everything behind it when that word was used? And before you know it, I was looking at my, I was like, eight hours, man, it's gone. I don't have time to do that now, but that was great when I had the time. Rightly dividing the word of truth. Let me say this about that. The Bible says that there is a spirit of truth and a spirit of error. Come on. Somebody will say, well, that's your interpretation. I'll say, okay, well, let's, let's, let's find out if it's my interpretation. What is the interpretation skills you're using to get the, the end result of what you believe to be the truth? Huh? What's the tools that you use to bring the interpretation to the point of what you believe, how did you come to that conclusion that it means that? Well, the Holy Spirit told me. Okay, Holy Spirit told you. So how do we judge what the Holy Spirit told you? Wait, wait, see, you don't understand, Pastor. You're not spiritual. You don't have the Holy Ghost like I do. The Holy Spirit spoke to me that this is what this means. Okay? But if we have to validate truth. How do, you value, how do you validate the truth that he spoke that to you? 
How do we validate that? And the Bible says test the spirits. See whether it be of God or not. How do we do that? How do we value truth? How do we come to the knowledge of truth? There are steps and means and way to do that, and that's in proper interpretation of the Bible. If we have true interpretation of the Bible, you will have the power and the authority of God behind you. If you misinterpret the Bible, there isn't going to be no power behind it. In fact, there may be a power behind it, but it won't be God's power because the devil is a deceiver from the very beginning. And I'll tell you, this spirit of error has been around for centuries. It's the same spirit that operated through the serpent. He was talking to Eve. What did he say to Eve? Oh, you're beautiful. Oh, you're sexy. You, you should go get another man. Adam's not good enough for you. You should be looking for another man. No. Why don't you marry somebody rich? No. How did he tempt her? Eve. Did he really mean what he said? That the day you... No, he's holding something back from you. He's not showing you the full revelation. And when she saw the tree was good to eat, what happened? She got deceived by false teaching. She got deceived by a false interpreting of what God said. It's right there in the beginning of the Bible. I have time, but I'll, I'll try to touch on um, six points of, of being qualified. Six points of being qualified to interpret the Bible. Number one, the interpreter must be born of the Spirit and of the Word of God. In other words, you must be born again. Well, my friend's not saved, but he understands the Bible. No, he only understands the surface of it. But he can't understand the things which are spiritual because the Bible says, for the unsaved uh, spiritually undiscerned, they cannot discern the Bible. They can't understand. That's why they're not born again. How many times have you heard this, a, a person say this to you? They can be a, in any religion, they can be in any denomination. Okay? Oh, I believe that when I die, all my good works are going to be weighed, and God's going to weigh my good and my bad. And and my good will outweigh my bad, and I'll be able to go to heaven. Right? I mean, we run into that a lot. Now, is that true? How do you know it's not true? What does the Word of God say? Not of works, not of works, lest any man should boast. Not of works. You cannot work your way into heaven. I don't care how good you are. See, I believe the total depravity of man, that when, when man fell, we have the fallen nature of Adam, we have that corrupt nature. So we sin because we, we sin because, we're, because we have a sinful nature, not because we're sinning. We sin because we have a sinful nature. It's just, it's just second nature, right? Before you were a Christian, you sinned all the time. You just lived in that sin, right? I mean, you use God's name in vain, just come out of your mouth like, like nothing. Didn't think nothing of it. Just like the world. That's why I don't judge them when they say those things. Because I was there. I did the same thing they did. We can't judge them because that's the only being who they are. But then they put on the religious side, you know. They're using God's name in vain. Then they go, they go to church. No. It's hypocritical. You've got to be born again. The only way you can start to interpret the Bible correctly is being born again. Why? Because his spirit will bear witness with our spirit. Amen. When his spirit bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God, guess what? Then he begins to open up more to us. And he'll begin to speak to us through the word. He'll begin to have a relationship with us. But an unbeliever, he's not going to do that. Amen. So the first qualification is to be born again.
As an interpreter of the word, we must be guided in our interpretation by the same spirit that inspired those who wrote it. Remember, it was the Holy Spirit that inspired them to write it. It will be the same Holy Spirit that will interpret it for us, the exact meaning of it. Praise God. You get anything out of this tonight? I hope so. Okay, number two, the interpreter must have a passionate hunger for the word of God. You've got to have a passionate hunger for God's Word. David had a passionate hunger for God's Word. Even though he messed up, but he had a passionate hunger. He was known as a man after God's own heart, wasn't he? But why, did, why, would, he, why would he want a hunger for God's Word so much? Because he said, Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not. Not that I would not sin, that I might not sin. Because how many know that the, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak? Sometimes we do sin. If we're honest, sometimes we do. Sometimes we slip. We don't live in it, hopefully. But sometimes we do slip. We make a side slip. But when, the, when we do make a side slip, the Bible says, if any man sins, he has an advocate with the Father, the Lord Jesus Christ. And if we confess our sin, he's and to of all our sin. So there's nobody perfect, including your pastor. I'm not perfect. Nobody is but Jesus. So number one, you've got to be born again. Number two, you've got to have a passion and hunger for God's word. Jesus said, blessed are they that hunger and thirst after, for they shall be. See how much of the word you know? But it's all coming out. See, the word will only, will only come out if you put it in. Number three, the interpreter must possess an attitude of humility. The scriptures exhort us to possess lowliness of mind, Philippians 2, 3, humility of mind, Acts 20, verse 19. This is all in your book, by the way. And humility, 1 Peter 5, 5. And we are to receive with meekness the engrafted word. James 1, 21. I want to put that up and we'll close with this. Let me just... Uh... Okay, so we're, we're finishing up with the interpreter must possess an attitude of humility. We're going to we'll stop there. I just need to stop. Let me just bend this. Okay, right here. All right, good. Therefore, lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness and receive, say the word receive, with what? Meekness or humility. The engrafted word. Which you'll be able to save your soul. Receive it with humbleness, humility. Why? Why do you have to be humble to receive? Yes, because God resists the proud. He resists you. If you're proudful, he'll resist you. He'll push you, uh, push you back. That's what it means to resist. You know, somebody, somebody you want to you wanna put under arrest, you grab them, you know, and stuff. But if they resist and they pull away from you, they don't want to be with you. Why? Why does God hate pride so much? Hmm? Because his worship leader, Lucifer, who used to, his whole body used to breathe worship to God. Read it. He was the worship leader in heaven. And pride got into him and he wanted to be like the most high God and he wanted the worship. When God saw that he had pride in him, God cast him out of heaven along with a third of the angels. And then you look at what pride has done to mankind. Even in the garden, pride was, I can live my life without God. Huh? That's right, it separates you from God. That's why he says he gives grace to the humble, but he resists the Receive with meekness.
the engrafted word. When you go to the word of God, go there with meekness. Go there with humility. Go there and say, God, you know, I, I messed up yesterday. I messed up last night or I messed up today. God, forgive me. Lord, speak to me through your word. Lord, I, I, wanna com I want you to communicate with me through your word. And please, please understand this. I understand a word of knowledge. God uses me in that. I understand a word of knowledge. But don't be those people that are running around all the time. You got a word for me? You got a word? You got a word? You got a word for me? Anybody got a word? I, sometimes people come to me, you got a word? I say, yeah, right here. Look, I got a whole 66 books for you right there. Plenty of word of God right there for you. No, I want a word. You got a word? Yeah, I got a word. I told you the story. I'll quit with this. You know, preachers, they keep going on and on. And then they say, I want to quit, and I'm going to quit, and they never do. One quick story. When we were in the little church over on Rockville Avenue, a man came in, sat right about way in the back, sat down. Left, didn't say hi, didn't say nothing. He did that for about two or three months. And one day he comes up to me and he says, um, Pastor, he says, I've been to your church about five or six times now, he says. He says, and every time I've come in, you've never had a word from me. But every other church I've gone to visit, I've gotten a word. The pastor gave me a word. So I've been to five churches. And every time I've gone there, the pastor has had a word for me. But I come to your church and you never have a word for me. I'm disappointed. So you know me. I said, you want a word? He said, yeah. I said, Give me a minute. I turned around. I talk, to, I talk to the Holy Ghost all the time. I don't know if you do, but I do. I said, Holy Ghost, what should I tell him? He said, tell him this. I said, okay. So I went back. And I said, excuse me. I got a word for you. He got all excited. You got a word for me? I said, yeah. He said, you got a word for me? I said, yeah. I said, I just spoke to the Holy Ghost. He's got a word for you. He said, well, 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 what is it? I said, you said to me that you went to church, five other churches, and five other pastors gave you a word, right? He said, yeah. He said, I said, okay, they, you, you sure they gave you a word? He said, yeah. I said, all of those five words, are you obeying those five words that were given to you? He said, no. I said, well, here's the word of the Lord to you. Don't expect another word from God until you start doing what he's already told you. I didn't see him anymore. Yeah, he didn't like the word. He didn't like the word, but the word is true. Look, God's not going to give you, you know, God's not going to promote you to second grade if you're not doing first grade work. Why would he promote you to second grade? Why would he give you more if you're not even obeying what he's telling you over here? He won't. I mean, come on. I mean, I... I could go on story after story and tell you about some of the crazy things people ask me to pray for. But I won't. I'm just going to close because, again, it's already 8.30. Time goes by fast when you're having fun, isn't it? All right, so uh, the, the, we've talked about the three things, qualifications, the importance of being born again. The interpreter must have a passionate hunger for God, and the and interpreter must also possess an attitude of humility. And we'll finish this off next week. Hopefully, God bless you. And let's close in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you. We, <clears throat> we praise you tonight. Father, we thank you for those on, on, on Facebook. God, we ask your blessing upon them. Father, the congregation here tonight, bless them for coming in. Lord, some couldn't make it tonight, and they're watching by Facebook. God bless you. We love you. And I pray, Father, that you bless them going in. They're coming out. They're lying down. They're rising up. God, be with them today and protect them from the onslaught of the enemy. And when the enemy comes in like a flood, God, you will raise up a standard against that enemy. And, Father, it's the blood of Jesus. And so I plead the blood of Jesus from the crown of their heads to the soles of their feet. Keep them safe, Father, until we meet again on Sunday morning. Father, I pray that this church will get excited about evangelism, will get excited about sharing the gospel, will get excited about winning souls, will get excited about healing people and delivering people from demonic oppression and possession. Father, I pray that this church you'll set on fire by the Holy Ghost. God, that you'll impart to them the Holy Ghost and power and dunamis power and anointing. And that, God, they will go forth like an army into this world, Father, with the power and the anointing of your Holy Spirit. 
and lead people to Jesus Christ in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. God bless you tonight. Hallelujah. Yes. Yes, let's pray for Louis. Father, we pray for Louis Dewey. Lord, we pray for his, his need to be operated on. But Father, I pray that you give him a nurse that's a Christian or a doctor that's a Christian. Father, I pray, God, that, Lord, he will be spoken to, Father, while he's under, under anesthesia, that you'll speak to his heart, Father. And God, that you will bring him closer to you, that he'll want to come to church, he'll want to come.